My name is Sarah Ronald. I'm a multidisciplinary artist living as an uninvited guest on the traditional lands of the Snawanaz people, otherwise known as Nanus First Nation. I am a second generation Canadian of Scottish and Dutch descent, and the land that I am lucky enough to be caretaking right now is located in Nanus Bay. My art practice has been largely concerned with wildlife's experience of humans, and my practice includes a variety of resources. This includes my own observations and encounters from living around wildlife and suburban spaces, my explorations into creative writing as artistic medium, as well as ecological findings from field experts, and from independent research into animal rights from a moral and ethical standpoint. In my practice, I feel a responsibility to question our methods of presenting animals, both through visual representation, but also the ways in which we consider or do not consider the animals in our daily lives. I seek to highlight the ways in which speciesism in popular culture influences how wildlife are treated in the real world. In my practice so far, I've largely rejected the use of humans as subject. I've done this very intentionally. Even though the basis of my practice is very much in response to human behavior, the focus of my work has been to elevate and prioritize the animal experience and to prompt viewers to reconsider their own behavior towards wildlife in the real world. However, my past processes and ways of generating work have unexpectedly led me towards an interesting consideration of my own animalness and to begin to include my own species in my work. Perhaps this is a full circle address of speciesism where I've been rejecting my own as subject and am now considering the human animal too. I have three main research questions that are unfolding at this point. Number one, how can I incorporate the human as an equal species of representation in my own art practice? And by extension, what steps need to be taken to ensure that the human does not overtake my other subjects within the ecosystem of my practice? How can I depict something as being alive? I know when it does not feel alive. But is it possible to achieve my vision of having a direct experience with a wild animal? And number three, how can one portray the time of things? If we can come to deeply consider the time of things, there becomes a greater value in reparation and protection. The work generated from these questions may be presented through visual art, writing, sound, installation, or other storytelling processes, such as the following musings stirring in my mind. A turkey vulture feather revealed that it had traveled to places that I have never been. Time is the only thing that links this whole world together. As I say these words, I am older than the vulture who grew that feather. There is a time within my life that the vulture was an egg that hatched. It grew and consumed and flew for the very first time to its summer family resting area a collection of cottonwood trees growing along the bank where the Fraser River and the Pitt River join and meet with the Pacific Ocean. The intersection of fallen forest, human debris, and oceanic flotsam churn a stew that the ocean breathes up and down, leaving shores rich with carrion and nutrients and plastic waste. I wonder, what was I doing when the vulture first hatched and felt direct sunlight on its skin? Was it working in my studio? Was I hiking Burke Mountain with my two beagles? Was I at the dentist having my teeth drilled and reverting to my childhood mind, thinking about my mom coming to take me home? What did the vulture think the first time it landed on the cottonwood nesting area? Relief that the migration journey was over? Elation for the smell in the air? Was it content? Perhaps it was thinking about its mother. 
Every spring, 11 to 14 vultures flew back to roost near my home by the Fraser River. Their arrival brought me great joy for 18 years. In a few of my darkest days, they spiraled above my neighborhood and distracted me long enough to look up and breathe deeply. Every evening in spring and summer, they'd glide at eye level past my hillside window to their evening roost, positioned above the looking path where they dropped their feathers down to Argue Street, a road that was once brand new and drivable, then later closed to vehicles in the time that I called the area home. When I was living in the Lower Mainland, I was always seeing wild animals, often finding them disoriented and bewildered. I think about the animal experience of us in the giant mess of human-centric living. What was the animal doing before that human encounter? How did the encounter affect their day and behavior afterwards? I recently moved from a community of 60,000 people in the lower mainland of BC to a much smaller rural community on Vancouver Island, a population in my immediate neighborhood of around just 600 people. I'm trying to root myself, but so far I still feel like a wild animal that's been dropped into unfamiliar territory. I need to connect in a big way to this incredible new place. I am no longer encountering four-footed wildlife on a daily basis, a symptom of being in a less populated area that is on the fringe of the wilderness. The wildlife don't have to interact with humans here and they choose not to. That in and of itself is infinitely inspiring and affirming. Although I speak about the familiar vulture family back in my old home, I miss the coyotes the most. Coyotes don't live on Vancouver Island, which for me personally leaves a coyote-shaped hole in my soul. I feel like something is missing from my ecosystem. I remember the last two times that I saw coyotes before disconnecting from that ecosystem. The first was on a densely foggy night, the type of night where streets were empty and you feel the thick, damp air on your skin. The kind of night where you cannot see the street light poles, just the balls of diffused orange light hovering above the road. I pulled up to a stop sign, the final on-ramp to the Mary Hill Bypass. I could have slow rolled right through as there were no other people out, but I stopped to take in the mysterious streetscape. Suddenly, Directly in front of my headlights, a bright white tuft of fur caught my eye. Two coyotes, as if on a crosswalk, playfully crossed right up against the front of my car to the other side of the on-ramp, over to a patch of grass between the roadways. It was as if there was no human or car present at all. The final time that I saw a coyote from that ecosystem, it was a familiar female coyote walking in daylight along a bike path that runs along the Pitt River Road Industrial Park. I had seen her in the area many times over the years. I knew that she was simply out for a break from her pups and making her rounds and marks as part of her evening routine when the path becomes less populated. I had just parked my car to start a walk, but her movement down the path caught my eye and so I stayed beside my car to let her pass. Across the street from me, there was a four-person street line painting crew unclogging their machinery. One of the men saw her as she walked along the path. Instead of just letting her carry on, he put down his tools, stood up tall, and began to aggressively jog across the street to give her a scare. He went out of his way and stopped his work just so he could do that. While hazing is a necessity for animals who are looking to establish home boundaries, I know that in this case, she already worked in harmony with the ecosystem of the shoreline, away from the human species. And this is why I will be trying my very best to harmonize with this new ecosystem that I'm now creating from. Presence without imposition, as much as humanly possible.